Hello, and welcome back to Countdown by Deborah Wiles. Today we will be reading chapter 13, and I apologize in advance if you hear my dog barking in the background. He's panicking because the pest control guy is here. So, all right, let's see. Get my bookmark out. Um, when we last left Franny, her mother has just pulled up, and Uncle Otz is not with her. And the last sentence of the book is just three words, and it says, she has news. Chapter 13. Observation. Uncle Otz is in Malcolm Grove Hospital at Andrews Air Force Base under observation. I am flooded with sweet relief that, first of all, he's not dead. And that second, observation means they're just keeping an eye on him overnight and we can have him back tomorrow or Monday. Mom is as cool as a cucumber when she delivers this news. Crisp, controlled, and curt. I have a million questions, but I don't get to ask them. Mom takes one look at me and marches me and Drew into the bathroom, gets out the alcohol and the cotton balls, and starts asking questions. You guys remember what happened with Franny? Why she's so scratched up? I go for broke. I fell off my bike going downhill too fast. No problem. I'm not trying to deceive my mother. It's just that the truth is so complicated and it isn't necessary. I'm fine. I learned my lesson. I'm not going to try it again. And I telegraph Drew, don't say a word. Just keep your mouth shut. Mom begins the assault of my skin with alcohol, killing every last germ that has ever lived on my legs. Blow on it, I hiss between clenched teeth, and she does. She blows and blows, and I blow too, and soon the sting is gone. What hill, Drew? Mom asks as she screws the top back on the alcohol bottle. Drew stands there, just outside the bathroom door, and shuffles his feet. He won't look at my mother. The gravel pit is a secret, but it's not a lie. We just never mentioned its existence. That's called lying by omission, by the way. I can see Drew chewing on his response, and I am certain that we're about to get caught. Over by the school, he mutters, I am stunned. St. Drew has told a lie. There's only one problem with it. It's flat as a pancake over by the school. I blink and stare hard at Drew, trying to get his attention. Oh says mom, as if there are mountains surrounding the school and she knows just which one Drew means. The Thornburgs driveway, actually, I say. We aren't allowed on the Thornburgs property. They're old and like their privacy. Drew just doesn't want me to get in trouble, I say. But nobody was home and I just wanted to see what it would be like to speed down their driveway. It's so long and steep. I already know what it's like. I've done it a hundred times. Are you fibbing to me, Drew? asks my mother, clicking shut the door of the medicine cabinet. Yes, ma'am, says Drew, and the truth rolls right off his tongue in a whoosh of relief. I'm sorry. I never thought I'd live to see the day that you would lie to me, Drew Chapman. Not even for Franny. Tears flood Drew's eyes. He won't look at me or mom. You can't protect your sister from herself, snaps mom. Go to your room. Yes, ma'am. Drew turns to go, and I desperately want to grab him and hug him, but I don't. And soon he's sobbing downstairs in his bedroom, a fallen saint. Mom washes her hands. You're lucky you didn't kill yourself, young lady. I'm not sure she believes me, but she's not going to press it. Her face is puffy with fatigue and her shoulders sag, and I want to make it better for her. I'm sorry, Mom, and I mean it. She dries her hands on the small table by the door and sighs. It's time to grow up, Franny. Not only are you an example for Drew to follow, you represent, excuse me, you represent your family when you are off this property. Yes, ma'am. I've had enough to worry about without worrying about you when you are not home. Yes, ma'am. And I won't have you dragging your brother into a career of disobedience and lying about it. Yes, ma'am. Now, wash up for dinner and take a bath before bed. Yes, ma'am. After mom leaves the bathroom, I look to the ceiling and whisper, I'm glad we had this talk 
Mom. The good news about daddy being on a trip is that we have the following suppers in this order. Number one, the leftovers. Number two, scrambled eggs and biscuits with cheese. Personally, I love breakfast for dinner. Number three, TV dinners, of which meatloaf and mashed potatoes are my favorite. I try not to eat the rubbery green beans. Number four, grilled cheese sandwiches and Campbell's tomato soup. We also get this choice on Tuesday nights when mom and dad go to their bowling league in their red shirts with their names on them. And number five, McDonald's. It's a restaurant. This is a sometime treat. There are no waiters and no waiting at McDonald's. When you get there, you go to a counter and order from a big menu that's on the wall. And the people behind the counter put the food all wrapped up and on a tray. And then you take the tray to a table and you eat it. The wrapper is your plate. You can dump your French fries on the wrapper and have a whole meal just like that. There's ketchup for the fries in little packets. Everything but the tray gets thrown away at the end. There's not even any dishes. McDonald's is brand new. And we've got one right outside Andrews Air Force Base. So how it usually works in my family is we all go to the car to drop daddy off at Andrews. And then mom, if she's in a good mood or wants to do something at home like yard work instead of messing up the kitchen, takes us to the golden arches. We go inside. Mom orders five hamburgers, five french fries, and five cookies. We eat. Oh, how I want to try the fish sandwich, the chocolate shake, the apple pie. No, mom always says, that's fine. Uncle Lots always eats his hamburger and then walks to the counter and dumps 25 cents out of his pocket and buys a fish sandwich anyway, which he eats except for one bite, which he gives me first. And I tear up thinking about that now. Tonight should be leftovers night. The first night daddy is gone, but mom tells me that Joe Ellen, excuse me, but mom tells Joe Ellen she can't face leftovers tonight. And Joe Ellen offers to scramble eggs while mom takes a shower. Franny will help me, Joe Ellen says, and I do. I love popping open the biscuit can and putting the biscuits on the tray. Then I take square slices of American cheese and fold each one twice so that each slice is divided into fourths. When the biscuits are almost done, Joellen takes them out of the oven and opens them up with a knife and inserts the cheese into each biscuit, then runs them back into the oven for another minute. These are the world's best biscuits, and Joellen makes good scrambled eggs. Annie May, the colored woman who works for my grandmother, Miss Maddie, taught her. And when she was 11, she learned that whole summer. We spent two whole weeks in Mississippi that summer, like we always do. I was four years old and I ate so many scrambled eggs. Miss Maddie told me I was going to turn into an omelet. Get any good mail today? I asked Joellen as we set the table. None of your business, she says coolly. What happened to you? None of your business, I say, just as coolly, tit or tat. And then, because I feel like it, and it's a good idea to change the subject, I say, Chris Kabas moved back in across the street. Really, says Joe Ellen. I thought they were in Pakistan. I put the jelly on the table. They came back. My stomach grumbles at the smell of biscuits cooking, eggs scrambling. I missed lunch, and I'm hungry. Mom appears with Drew and Jack behind her. Out. She orders Jack. Poor Jack slinks down the carpeted stairs, but only two steps and sneaks the tip of his snout over the top step so he can still be near us. Mrs. Kabaz stopped by the hospital, says mom, as if she were part of our conversation all along and missed nothing. She's wearing her nightgown and bathrobe, her wet hair is combed straight back. Her face is scrubbed so clean it's red. It's six o'clock and the sun is still up. Well, barely. It's dusk. Mom lights a cigarette and pours a cup of coffee from the percolator. She blows a stream of smoke to the ceiling and says, Irene Kavas is the epitome of discretion. Thank goodness. But this is going to be all over the neighborhood by tomorrow. Thanks to Martha Gardner and her gossiping mouth. Pour the milk, Franny. I pour three glasses of milk. I like Mrs. Gardner. She's nice. Joellen puts plates of steaming scrambled eggs on the table. Your father comes home Monday. 
mom tells us. I don't know about Uncle Ox. And her voice cracks in the tiniest way. We all lean towards her. She waves a hand. Oh, I'm tired. Fran is having a Halloween party, says Drew in a cheer up in a cheer you up voice. How is this helpful? I kick Drew under the table and pop up to serve the biscuits. Mom says nothing, and it's suddenly so quiet I can hear the tick of the mantle clock in the living room. I'm going to be an astronaut at her party, Drew adds in a hopeful voice. Mom rubs her forehead with her two middle fingers like she's trying to force the right words to come out of her mouth. Drew, Halloween is the furthest thing from my mind right now. The front yard is a holy mess. Your uncle is in the hospital and your father is on a trip. Mom's voice rises with each thing. She ticks off her list. I am the laughing stock of the entire neighborhood, if not the base. My children lie to my face and no one understands the gravity of the situation in this family. Nobody. And she looks at Joe Ellen. She takes another drag on her cigarette and blows the smoke out in a long, thin stream. And then she looks straight at me and sets her jaw. Franny, to even suggest a Halloween party at a time like this is the most insensitive thing you've ever done. She picks up her coffee cup, turns to leave the kitchen, turns it back and says, a rush. No, I take that back. The most insensitive thing you've ever done is allow your uncle to exhaust himself in the front yard in front of God and everybody. And I hope you're proud of yourself. To say that I am stunned is an understatement. I am slapped. I am slugged. I am guilty. I am a horrible person. I'm sure you can finish dinner without me, says mom. And she looks at Joellen who stares at her shoes. Am I right, Joellen? Yes, ma'am, Joellen says in a voice so quiet, I can hardly hear it. Drew stares at mom's plate, streaming, steaming with scrambled eggs that she will never eat. I cannot breathe. Mom sighs as if she might remember, excuse me, mom sighs as if she might reconsider everything she just said, and maybe she does, but she doesn't say so. Instead, she says, I'm going to roll my hair. Be ready for Sunday school and church tomorrow morning at nine sharp. We all need it. Some of us more than others. I don't feel like cheese in my biscuits. I don't feel like eating at all. And before anyone can say anything else, I take my dark heart to my room and I stay there. The end. What do you think about the mom's reaction? I think mom is probably a little bit stressed out over a lot of situations that are going on. Hmm. She also seems like she's frustrated with Joellen. What do you think that might be about? And now we've got St. Drew, who's told a lie for the first time. And Franny's made up a Halloween party that's not actually happening. Join us back tomorrow for Chapter 14. Have a great day.